Welcome to Macomb on the Move. To get this interview done, it's been an extraordinary adventure. I began yesterday uh, in Corpus Christi, Texas, caught a flight out of there at 4.30 in the afternoon, got into Houston about 6 o'clock, was there for about 30 seconds, and caught another flight to Midway. Um, got in there about 10 o'clock, uh, met my wife at a local uh, hotel. We got to sleep about 11 o'clock, woke up this morning at 4.15, we're on the road at 4.30, pulled into Macomb at 8.30, and here we are. Now, what makes today's interview so extraordinary is that we've been doing this for about 15 years. And we, Mark Dial and I have done 250 of these out at Western with Across the Miles, and now this is our 25th one with the city of Macomb, on Macomb on the Move. And during that time, we've had the good fortune to do both of John T. Bernhard's adult children. Then we were able to do President Malpass, President Wagner, President Spencer, Interim President Taylor, President Goldfarb, President Thomas, Interim President Abraham, and today, the 12th President of Western Illinois University, Dr. Dr. Gui Yu Huang. Welcome. Thank you so much. Great the longest you. introduction I've ever had. The forum, the forum is yours. Okay. Tell us a little bit about this young man sitting next to me or in front of me who was born in 1961 and is a youthful 59 years old. Right, yeah, 59 years old and born on Christmas Eve of all places, right? I don't get to celebrate my birthday alone. Oh, you sound like my, my mother-in-law was the same. She was born on Christmas Day and she yeah. lamented that all the time That's that I, <laughs> I got cheated out of my birthday. So another few days I would be born in, um, in 1962. Born where? I was born in a very interesting place in China, actually, the north, northern, northwesternmost province of China. Sometimes I joke by saying it's China's Muslim province because most of the inhabitants there are Muslims, and most of whom are Uyghurs. And there are Kazakhs, but I'm a Han Chinese, meaning um, I was born in a family of uh, uh, the mainstream Chinese uh, Han population. Talk about your mom and dad. Well, they are both uh, in another world now. Uh, so uh, uh, they both received seven years of schooling, both of them. Uh, they were both well-traveled and both well-read. So my father worked many years as a accountant. So it's very good with the numbers, right? So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a man. Uh, he came to visit me um, when I was first uh, teaching in Pennsylvania. So he spent four months with me. So he saw for the first time, and the only time, and what America was like. Uh, my mother never got that opportunity because uh, she passed away uh, before that. Uh, yeah, she didn't know I would be I would be going to grad school or coming to America for an advanced degree. She had no knowledge of oh. that. Um, but I did have great parents because um, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, very few parents were thinking about their kids' education. My parents did. What? They really wanted us to go to high school first and then college if possible. We all ended up with uh, advanced graduate degrees of all of us. What very the? lucky for us. What life lessons did you learn from your mom? Well, she probably was the most important woman uh, in my life. She gave me my life, of course, and then my wife. A lot of women played a very important roles in my life. So my mother first, my wife, uh, you know, a high school English teacher who really changed my life. And then before I came to this country, a secretary, a woman at Beijing University, um, it helped change the direction of my life. All these uh, women, I can never thank them enough. My 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 mother uh, was uh, uh, a very good reader. She's one of the m more reflective people I've ever known. She would teach us to, if we did something wrong during the day, she said, "Tonight, <laughs> when you are not sleeping, think, oh no, reflect on what you did today. Something that's not necessarily." Uh, meeting her approval, right? So I think she really taught me to be reflective, to be thoughtful, and to correct my behavior if I was off track, you know, previously. Uh, my father is the opposite. He was mainly uh, in the American slang, would be the, the breadwinner. 
uh, you know, he made sure that we were fed, we were, cl uh, you know, clothed, and uh, we got uh, our education that he think was very important. So I, I was lucky, I, we had a really good parents in that regard. In a time when China was politically uh, very chaotic, uh, even violent, uh, in, the, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, for, for a period of 10 years, uh, so uh, 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 those 10 years were perhaps the most challenging years politically, um, culturally, and uh, uh, socially in the recent history of China. Your dad taught you about the importance of courage and justice, too. Doesn't, aren't those a couple of attributes that he said were very important for you to take I think with you? so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, my father, uh, 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 amongst his peers, you know, the, the the people of his age, he probably traveled more than anybody else I was aware. Living, we mentioned my birthplace in northwestern China, live there, work there, then northeastern China, uh, live there, work there, uh, before we finally moved back to the east coast of China, where my ancestry was. Right, so but he was really a, a brave person. Uh, I, you know, think about the way he led his life. The way he uh, and uh, dealt with uh, uh, problematic situations, he was a courageous person in any way I can think of. You know, he was not shy, and he taught me to be brave and to face the reality. You have you have siblings? I have. Yeah, I do. Yeah, they are scattered. And so I have a brother uh, who actually studied, uh, got his MBA in this country in Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, he thought it was best for him to return to China because he thought the lifestyle there uh, suited him better. Uh, you know, uh, he was uh, uh, pretty, pretty successful in financial terms. He worked for the government, what we call the central government, like the federal government here, but the central sure. government. Uh, he still lives in Beijing. Um, uh, 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 he used to live between Beijing and Hong Kong. He traveled to many countries too. Uh, now I have a sister uh, who uh, who lives in uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, and she lives in Switzerland. This is one of the things um, that my <coughs> excuse me, my father wanted, maybe unconsciously. Uh, he said this. He said, you know, you know, all the relatives and friends we had, we had a lot of them. They all wanted their children to live close by or nearby when they grew up. My father told us, you know, point blank, when you grow up, you know, go away and live in a place as far as possible from me. And his words <laughs> became true, right? My brother in Beijing, before my father passed away, he lived in the coastal province in China. And my sister in Australia, I'm in Illinois, Illinois. How far away can you be from your parents? Mm, yeah, his day. words did come true, uh, interestingly. And you have, and you ha uh, tell, me, tell me about your family, your wife, kids. Yeah, I, I have two kids. My, uh, my wife, uh, her real name is Yu Feng Qian. She often goes by uh, her adopted American name, Jennifer. Uh, she, um, uh, she was born and raised in Beijing uh, uh, and grew up in Beijing, of course. Uh, 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 that remains her favorite city, one of my own favorite cities where my brother and his family still reside. Um, currently, she's a professor of education um, at LSU, Louisiana State University. Uh, she, uh, she teaches courses in uh, uh, educational research, uh, foundation courses, technology courses, statistics, uh, wow. research methodology. Um, she's a real scholar, um, published a few books, many articles. Uh, uh, and right now she lives in Macomb with me and Claire. Uh, she teaches uh, online. And she's also the program director or coordinator of the EduTech tech program at LSU. As you know, I was a chancellor uh, at one of the uh, regional campuses of LSU in Alexandria. That's how it came about. So uh, that's my wife. Um, where, two where, where did you meet? Oh, we met in Beijing. And you met in Beijing, met in and Beijing. was first date? The first date? Yeah. Oh, that was back in the, uh, in the mid-90s. Do you remember it? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, actually, I don't remember that date. I, I, won't, I hope she won't mind. But we were married in, uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Oh. Yeah, we met in Beijing. We got married in, 
in Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania. We'll talk a little uh -huh. bit about uh, Claire and George. Yeah. And so uh, George is uh, uh, the firstborn. Uh, he's 20 years old. Uh, he's, uh, he will be a senior uh, at Rice University in Houston, Texas, where you just were, where I, I was a few days ago. <laughs> yeah, he's back. Uh, he's a double majoring in political science and history. He has a passion for both history and, and uh, politics. Uh, I think in his mind, someday he wants to be a lawyer. So he's uh, studying for it. Um, maybe he will become a lawyer, but uh, that remains to be seen. He's uh, uh, academically a very strong student. Um, uh, he got very good grades at Rice. Uh, before college, um, he did very well in several schools. We moved a lot, uh, around a lot. I'll say. Yeah, and, uh, but um, he was able to uh, make a championships in debate, both in Vermont and state championships, both in Vermont and Louisiana. Uh, so he went to a college and that he really loves, and he loves uh, uh, Rice University and uh, the city. He loves Houston. Um, I lived in that area for six years, so it was uh, maybe was meant to be. Claire is 10 years old. Um, she attends uh, a St. Paul school in town, in Macomb. So far, um, she told me and her mother repeatedly, this is the best school she has ever attended. And no Great. kidding. She's really serious about saying that. And she loves the teachers and the principal and everybody there. And she doesn't want to stay at home on weekends. She wants to go to school. She she really regrets she's not able to go to school on weekends. She uh, she accompanied you to the Gwendolyn Brooks dedication she did? a couple of weeks ago. That's right. I had a chance to meet her. Oh, you did, yeah. Delightful young lady. Yeah, yeah you did. That's you right. were having a hard time with parking. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> she was very patient. Uh, she sat there for the several hours. Very patient. And uh, uh, it was sort of disciplined, uh, and um, so she's a very positive person. How about your, how about your education, gra uh, undergraduate and graduate? Yeah, I had a very interesting educational journey, just thinking about you know uh, the education of Henry Adams, right? That famous book. Um, uh, I must say that uh, my first nine years of uh, schooling, um, uh, I wasn't sure how much I was learning. I mentioned earlier. China in those years were politically uh, very eventful, very violent. Um, and I, I, I'll tell you a story whether or not you don't believe it's up to you, but it's real to me. Uh, we were in six day schools, right? Uh, on, every Wednesday afternoon, we did nothing but do what we call political study. So we would study uh, documents, issues, uh, uh, announcements made by the government. We were spending the afternoon doing that. Saturday afternoon, the same thing. On Friday, typically, we took time to do what we call manual work. It could be cutting grass, could be pick up manure somewhere. It's, that's what the school did in those years. Yeah. So it's, uh, and then though the emphasis was also on what they call uh, awkwardly three goods, you have to be uh, morally or virtually good, you have to be academically good, and also physically fit, physically good. Those are the three goods, that literally, okay? Um, those are the things that we did. Uh, we were not studying as much. So then... <clears throat> were you a good manure guy? I guess I was good enough to be uh, in the company of many others who do the same thing. <laughs> uh, so uh, then I, I spent only one year in high school before I went to college. The college uh, is very unique. It's called a Chufu Normal University. Unique uh, in every way, because it was uh, uh, established in 1955, um, uh, uh, located in Confucius, his birthplace, and establishing his memory. Right, it's so unique in that regard. There's only one right, Confucius, yeah, one, Confucius. Well, one Socrates, one Plato, right? right. He's one of those three um, uh, historical figures. Um, in a small city of uh, a quarter million, uh, characterized by the Confucius Temple, the Confucius Mansions, and the Confucius uh, Forest where he's buried. His tomb is still there. Um, so, uh, and that university is unique because it's, uh, it has a very strong programs, nationally known programs in English, mathematics, education, history, Chinese, 
are really, really strong programs, nationally known. Uh, also, it is the only university that has a nickname that is called Graduate Student Production Base. Uh, the anecdote is that university is the only one in China that graduates uh, are the highest percentage of students who go on to grad school. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. They don't, that school itself doesn't like that name. When I go visit, I said, you should use it. <laughs> Nobody else has that name, yeah. graduate student production base. Uh, this year, I heard a report that uh, 50 students in 50 dormitory rooms, in 50, five zero, with no exception, all of them in those 50 dormitory rooms were accepted to graduate schools, top graduate schools throughout the country. It's this year. And where did you go? Uh, I went to Beijing University, uh, lucky for me. Um, uh, some people like to say uh, China is Harvard, but that's not the way I see it. Uh, it uh, I characterize Beijing University as a combination uh, of uh, Harvard and Berkeley. It has a, Berkeley's a political activism, Harvard's in traditional edu, edu, educational excellence. So how do you end up at Texas A&M? College Station out yeah. in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, somewhere, right? Uh, College Station, yeah, you know, I moved from Beijing uh, in a very interesting year, uh, uh, early summer of uh, 1989, uh, uh, when China uh, was ending a pretty uh, bad episode. Um, so, um, uh, but before that, I was admitted to Texas A&M with uh, what is called a graduate assistantship. So that's a lot of money for me. It's $800 per month Ooh. for uh, you know, student oh, yeah. graduating from uh, sure. a, a grad school. Uh, I met great professors. And, um, so went there for my doctoral degree in English, specifically American literature. Uh, A&M is a great school, uh, a very strong in research, great professors, a very expansive uh, uh, campus, 5,400 5, acres of land. There is a book that's, uh, on the 300 uh, famous colleges in the U.S., something like that says, if you want to go to a school that has its own airport, its own army, and its own uh, airport army and um, uh, airport army and something else. You go to Texas in that. And you used to have the bonfire till the tragedy. When I was there, yes. Yeah. No, the oh. tragedy happened afterwards. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I went to see it a couple of times. Yeah. It was wild. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it, was it was fiery. <laughs> yes, indeed it was. Yeah. 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 So, uh, favorite American authors? I have a bunch, you know, I used to teach uh, a lot of uh, American authors, you know, I taught people like uh, Toni Morrison, who wrote uh, The Beloved, Beloved, Blue's Eye, uh, authors like uh, Faulkner, who wrote uh, Light in August. Uh, a, rose, a Rose for Emily. A rose, oh, one of oh, my favorite. Oh, my goodness yeah, that, sakes, yeah. That's a dark, dark story. It is story. very dark, yes. Yeah, it's hard yes. to explain that to the American student, not to mention Chinese students, so why did this happen? Yeah. Well, I know a background, but I, we can't get into discussions today. Um, Walt Whitman, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, uh, um, you know, Dan Brown, all great writers, and Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Lincoln. I, I'm one of the few people who probably have read all the poems President Lincoln wrote. Really? You're yeah. So you're a prolific reader. I read a, I read a lot. I both read in Chinese, and English. I was also to read a lot in in French as well. But uh, yeah, I have favorite French authors and Russian authors and Japanese authors too. So yeah. <laughs> now it's time to go to work. Yeah. So you are at. I'm just going to run through these. Yeah. Beijing University. Yeah. Texas A and M. Right. Lehigh. Yeah. Great school. Kutztown University of Pennsylvania, where you happened to meet who? No, I didn't meet him there, but this is Kutztown University. The current president, Ken Hawkinson, is the former provost here. We right. met when we were both presidents at, uh, in Pennsylvania. We were in the same system. He lives in the president's house there, uh, where I had several dinners when I was uh, a faculty member. I went back to see him and his wife, lovely couple. Anne Marie, people. yes. Anne Marie, yes. Yeah. yeah. Grand Valley State in Michigan. Yeah. St. Thomas University in Miami Gardens. Right. 
Norwich University in Vermont, mm -hmm. LSU, Alexandria, and Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, your last stop. Yeah. What have you learned uh, during your leadership roles at these institutions? Well, colleges are different. Uh, they all have their proud, uh, you know, points of pride. And they all work uh, uh, to produce the next generation of leaders, next generation of citizens. So colleges and universities are incredible uh, force in shaping the future of humankind, in shaping the direction of uh, 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 civilization. The thing that I learned, I, I, I was a faculty, I taught for many years, uh, then became a leader, I was a chair, you know, a university director, um, college director, dean, division dean. At each level I learned something new because I encountered new problems, I met new people. Each person has their own merit, and they teach me different things. Um, so I learned that uh, you know the job of an educator is extremely important. Being an educator, can inf a professor can influence a lot of students in the classroom. But being a leader and an educator, you can change the life trajectories of many more people. Uh, and I didn't design to be a leader, but I became one, uh, you know, uh, through hard work and, and the uh, change of circumstances. Um, so I, you know, along the way, I encountered uh, good mentors, which I think is very important uh, for the success of every individual. You've been, you're well traveled. Um, did you experience racism on your travels at these different schools? Was that out there? Uh, I think racism is real. Um, you know, uh, in my mind, I see two types of racism. Uh, it can happen in any country. I'm sure China is not different because in China, when I lived in Beijing, you, you encounter people from all over the world. Then people uh, of Chinese citizenship, like Tibetans, Mongolians, Manchurians, uh, minority, minority groups, you, I encountered all of them. And I saw some manifestation of racism in that country, as I did in other countries, and because of the, the color of your skin, the texture of your uh, hair, and the way you dress, the way you smell, right? We cook and eat different things. Uh, so I, I see that. The, for me, the two types are the open, co uh, uh, overt racism, you can see. People writing things on your car, people calling you by certain names, and then that's overt, open racism. Uh, the harder type is the subtle or covert racism. Uh, people choose to ignore you because of your ethnicity, your religion, your culture, or the way you behave, right? Um, that's harder to combat. Right? I think if we, as a, as a, as a human species, if we can effectively deal with covert, subtle racism, everybody will be a better person, right? You know, uh, I understand uh, people have different uh, feelings or opinions about, you know, uh, different groups. Even within, say, the white population, there are groups. Within the Asian population, there are groups, right? Uh, and a lot of these opinions are legitimate. Uh, you know, rooted in something. Some of them are less so. Uh, but I think every citizen, uh, every educator has a, a tremendous responsibility um, to combat racism, whether it's on the university campus or in a community. I think the th important thing really is how do we deal with uh, ignorance. By ignorance, I meant that in a general sense, right? I'll tell you a story if you have the time. Yes, when I lived in Allentown, which is only 90 miles from Manhattan, New York, my wife and I would drive up there just for a meal and, uh, and uh, you know, shopping and meet people and friends. In this restaurant, we sit down to, have, um, to eat a dim sum, right, the small dishes for lunch. And so a middle-aged woman came to me, a Chinese woman, Cantonese woman, who came to us, and without any warning, she spoke to us in Cantonese. So it's a, it's a dialect in southern China, spoken in Guangdong province, Hong Kong, Macau, for, for natural, right? But I didn't understand a single word of it. 
So I said, I said, do you speak Mandarin or standard Chinese or English? Then she said, yes, I do. Now what's happened next surprised me. He, she said, how long have you been living in America? I said, eight years. And she was even more surprised by saying, you have lived here for eight years and don't speak Cantonese? I was dumbfounded. I said, I didn't come here to study Cantonese. I came here to study English. And that type of ignorance, right? Where do you find it? How did it come around? That's the responsibility of an educator, right? You may come here to study Cantonese, but I did not, right? You may come here to study French in America. There are people who are studying Russian, Japanese, Swahili in China. Right? Because that's what their intent. Right. I mean, this ignorance of other groups, other cultures, other religions, you can eliminate a lot of it by knowing their people, knowing their languages, or knowing their culture, their cuisine. I've traveled, to, you mentioned, like, a lot of countries. And I knew I'm not going to ask questions that could offend them because they respect their culture, their customs, their traditions. Right. We may not. But not asking questions that could be offensive, you would show respect to them, to their culture. Again, racism is real. Uh, I, I think now the society is getting better as a whole, understanding other groups. When I learned something recently from my wife. She showed me a quote. You know, uh, many people may be familiar with it. You may be the sweetest peach, but just remember some people don't like peaches. You know, it's really, um, it's, uh, I want people uh, to judge others on the merit of their own strength or weaknesses, not uh, stigmas, not uh, stereotypes. And that's, those are the things that we need to combat on a daily, weekly basis. I personally encounter racism here and there, right? Uh, subtle as they are, it's discernible. It, it, you can feel it. Um, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to be bothered by it on a daily basis because I have a job to do. Some people warmly accept me for who I am, some maybe less so. I will accept that reality as well, but uh, I'm really able and willing to work everybody. I hope other people behave the same way. Edinburgh, Edinburgh was your last stop. Yes. And you did some dramatic things there, but you said you're proudest of the fact that you were able to stabilize the situation there. What do you mean by stabilize? Was it, was it chaotic when you got there? A couple of things. Uh, so they were faced with, uh, you know, uh, a significant deficit, uh, right, uh, debt service. Um, there are also a discussion about uh, faculty retrenchment, staff furloughs. Those were, those were big deals. Sure. Uh, we were able to uh, handle them, I think, pretty methodically and creatively. Uh, it's not the you know, I was there a year and a half, you know, not everything has borne uh, born a, a fruit or a result. Um, uh, we were able to reduce the deficit significantly, working with um, the system leadership, the trustees, my own uh, cabinet level uh, colleagues. Um, so. Um, the reduction of the deficit was really significant. Uh, we stabilized the enrollment um, during COVID. That was significant, right? Um, uh, the discussion regarding faculty retrenchment was, uh, retrenchment was a tough conversation because the student faculty ratio was low, which is also true here, by the way. Yeah. I have not been shy saying that uh, to the faculty leaders on our own campus. We are 13 to 1. Where I was with 13 to 1, right? Um, and that's the ratio you would typically find in a relatively small liberal arts college. And the national average is above 20 to 1, right? The, the strategic plan for WIU, higher values in higher education, calls for a 17 to 1 ratio. And that number is important, right? Because if the ratio is 17 to 1 for Western. Uh, if we indeed we reach it in a few years, the university will be financially a lot more financially sustainable. I've done it, I've seen it, and I know it. 
How about um, the, uh, the, the the road to get you to Western? Why did you Why did you come here? What What attracted you to Western Illinois University? Yeah, you know, when you land in a position, it's not a one factor, right? Just like coming to America. You know, uh, what made you come to America? It's not a one or two thing, right? I knew about Western, right? Uh, even a little more through, you know, uh, uh, Ken. Uh, uh, it, you know, I, I consider him a trustworthy friend, right? Um, and uh, uh, when you get a phone call, right, say, hey, the opportunity to look at. Uh, that happened to me a number of times in my uh, uh, career in this, this country for 32 years, right? Uh, what is the potential of the university? This university does have great potential. It uh, has great faculty and staff. We have, um, the university has a impressive range of uh, alumni, a hundred, you, you know this because you are in that business, uh, you have uh, 140,000 alumni living throughout the world. And that's very significant. And um, now one, one of the many ideas I brought here is how do we make the university even more distinctive, therefore more attractive, more appealing to First of all, students, prospective students. Second, parents. And thirdly, to uh, future employers, right? You know, it, when you want them to think about the Western graduates when they hire people. You want the parents to think about the Western when they want to send their kids to, to college, right? We know college education is one of the greatest equalizers, right? Uh, uh, in terms of social, uh, economic income, social status, right? Western has done a good job of educating first gener generation students, uh, students from uh, economically challenged uh, environments, students of uh, diversity background, students of color, and so uh, I, I, uh, that's a strength. That's I, and in terms of my own leadership, I think I could um, lead the university uh, to use a cliche to a higher level of academics, a reputation, a morale, and many other things. Um, uh, the, the university, I think, is poised uh, for greater distinction, greater stature. But we have to do things, uh, set up right priorities, and do them right. When those things are said and done, we should be, we, we would be in a, uh, in a. Um, a better place in terms of morale, um, uh, academic rigor, the quality of our graduates, and uh, uh, our appeal uh, to uh, our external stakeholders. What do you bring us? <laughs> uh, well, a lot of things. I, I do have. Uh, I do have a lot of experience. Uh, 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 leading higher, uh, in, leading uh, as a leader in higher education, I, I've I've been to. I was talking about uniqueness. I, I'm one of the few people, uh, girl, that you might find that truly uh, has a perspective that, that that you would not necessarily find in every college president. So I worked in public universities and private universities, military colleges and non-military colleges. Uh, religious colleges and non-religious colleges. You don't see a lot of people like me like that, right? And I worked in American universities and Chinese universities. So those are a number of uniquenesses already, right? In that regard, I'm not a conventional, traditional American college president. And on top of that, I'm one of very few presidents who have an immig immigrant background. Most American college presidents are you know, native-born Americans, you know, uh, and they do great, great work, great leaders. Um, but very few of us uh, are immigrants, very few. You can count them, you know, maybe on a few fingers. <laughs> I, I know I'm only one of the three. Uh, I'm one of uh, only three uh, Chinese-American president that came from China. And I was the first one also. I was the first one, and right now only one of the three. What is your leadership style? Uh, great question. You know, uh, that's a, actually a very difficult question to answer. That requires knowing yourself, knowing your environment, knowing the people you lead. And the leadership is really understood in the context of followership. 
I, you know, I, you know, I like the story about Moses, right? Moses leading his people out of uh, Egypt, right? Uh, you you walk, you you walk, you move on. Uh, you have to look back to see are other people following you, right? <laughs> uh, that's Moses' story. Yeah. Lesson learned from Moses. Yeah. You know, I like to consult. I mentioned my mother and to be reflective, to be thoughtful, uh, to consult uh, with the um, faculty staff students you know um in the end uh, the leader is a leader because he or she leads set a vision set the priorities and make sure you have a structure and, and the organizational structure to make good things happen um and, and I, I sort of consider myself a servant leader i'm here to support to lead and also help solve problems once we solve these problems we can make progress. Servant leader, I've heard that. That's a, a very important concept these yeah. days. Um, we're going to open up yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Coming back. That's right. How come tomorrow? How come not August 13th? How That's come right. July 1st? Yeah, tomorrow coming back is really mainly the staff first, right? The uh, 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 administrative staff. But then again, um, uh, 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 a large number of leaders have always been on campus. I was on campus since day one, always on campus. I didn't miss a single day unless I was traveling, right? Um, meeting people in person. So um, we, we went through several processes to make that decision. Uh, the university has a, a risk management group. Um, you know, uh, they are led by professionals like John Smith, uh, Joe Roselib, um, uh, including academics, you know, and other leaders, they know the business. They know what is a risk, uh, how to mitigate or manage risks. Right now, uh, in view of what happened in the last few months in the federal government, the state government, the legislatures, Department of uh, Public Health, right, and the Macomb Department of Public Health, they are all good collaborators with us. Uh, we follow guidelines. We determined. July 1 would be safe enough for the staff to return first uh, while we uh, continue to talk with uh, uh, the faculty uh, union, uh, UPI, uh, to take care of their concerns before they can return safely uh, in, uh, I think, mid-August or thereabout. Right? Now, I have felt safe knowing that I'm fully vaccinated. Many people feel safe as well as we transition from uh, phase 4.5 to phase 5, right? Um, right? I've been traveling recently, as you have, and, you know, uh, looking at airports, Disney World. Everybody wears a mask at the airport. Not everybody. Not, not where, where, in where? Dallas, when I landed, oh. was... No. Oh, oh, no, it's funny. When I, when, I, when I landed in Corpus Christi, half the people were, but when, I, when we were taking off, everyone was. It was rather interesting. No, yeah, exactly. It's a mixture, yeah, right? You know, just yeah. like the country right yeah. now. Some people want it. And, of course, don't. in Texas, they do their own deal yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, you've been, so you've been, today's your six-month six anniversary. That's right. You are right. Exactly. I didn't think of it, yeah. First impressions of, of Macomb and Western. Uh, I think I'm in the right place. Uh, I have been, uh, by and large, uh, welcomed and accepted by a lot of people, both on campus and in the city. Uh, uh, Mayor Yima has been uh, uh, welcomed. You have been, many others. I met a lot of uh, alumni over the last uh, uh, two months, met just about 400 alumni at the golf, uh, uh, golf outing, uh, outings in Chicago uh, on campus. Then in Arizona and, and uh, Florida, uh, uh, many people uh, express support, express appreciation, uh, knowing that we have challenges. And the locals, you know, I felt welcomed. Um, it's safe, it's quiet. And I'll tell you something more personal. Uh, my son, when he was first uh, here, he was sleeping on the couch. He said, well, I've, this is <laughs> maybe the couch, maybe the house, maybe Macomb, the place he f uh, falls asleep most easily. Funny enough, my wife drew the same conclusion. Maybe because we live in a big place like you know, Beijing, Miami, close to the Philadelphia, uh, Grand Rapids in Michigan, right? Um, small towns like Edinburgh, all good, good small towns. Uh, we felt safe. Uh, it's quiet, very little traffic, right? So um, uh, my impressions have been positive, while knowing that uh, 
I'm looking at a lot of challenges, uh, especially for the university. That's my job, right? How do I uh, lead the university to a better place, right? Um, so, but first impressions have been really positive for me, my wife, and and Claire. George doesn't live with us, so you know he's a visitor. <laughs> any surprise? Any surprises in the community or at the university? Things you didn't expect? Uh, 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 some small surprises, right? Um, uh, the biggest surprise uh, is not a secret. You know, uh, uh, early on in my presidency here, I need to uh, a lot of discussion about the future of the Quad Cities campus. Uh, that was the surprise. But I had good colleagues. Uh, working with me um, on the PR side, uh, you know, on the government side, alumni, uh, you know, then uh, uh, local leaders in both Macon and Molain. Uh, that was not an easy conversation, but I do believe um, the broad leadership was good. Um, uh, we, we had a very good strategy working with uh, our own colleagues, in the state, uh, alumni, and, and the local politicians. Um, now um, we are very safe and happy to tell the rest of the world uh, uh, we are, I am, uh, the board. We are fully committed to the future of the Quad Cities campus. I had a good conversation recently with the new Mayor Moline uh, and um, the Chamber of uh, Commerce leadership very positive conversations. Right. And uh, I've, I, I've spent, in the last six months, uh, I was on the Quad Cities campus no less than 14 or 15 times, only six months. How do, you, how do you like Route 67? Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> That's not, another story. No, now. in winter it's not as good, but right now it's perfect. It's a little hilly up north, but you know I lived in Vermont, so yeah. it was nothing compared to Vermont in winter. Uh, what? Uh, um, yeah. What? What about a, your your leadership team? How are you assembling that? I mean, you 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 brought yeah. back the the great Billy Clow and Buzz Hewn, and when I say the great Buzz Hewn and Billy Clow, I probably answer my own question because yeah, 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 they're right, such yeah. talented men. But how are you supply? How are you putting yeah. together your team? What, yeah, are you, so, what are you looking for? Yeah, exactly. Great. You know, so uh, when I was new, I was saying I. Uh, I set the five priorities for the university. I'll name them quickly, right? So uh, recruitment and enrollment, student retention, um, diversity, equity, and inclusiveness, right? internationalization, uh, and, uh, and uh, Tangang relationships, right? Those are the, uh, some of the major priorities I set for the university. Would you, uh, would you go through those one more time? Because yes. they're so important. I want to make so, sure so, um, I, our audience uh, gets a chance to exactly. digest those. Recruitment and retain, uh, enrollment, that's one. Student retention. Uh, I, I, I should have mentioned institutional distinctiveness. Uh, right? yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, internationalization, uh, diversity, equity, uh, 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 inclusiveness, uh, and on the Tangang relationships. Not huh. so much six, Very, rather than five. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've Important. been working on those. We have uh, two plans developed for recruitment and enrollment. One, retention. Another plan. We have a report uh, on findings by the Institutional Distinctive Committee, right? I have a report that reviewed it, very good stuff. Um, so uh, those are the institutional, institutional priorities I set. Uh, I set myself a uh, personal priority that's building a uh, highly functional, uh, effective and efficient, forward-looking uh, senior leadership team. I've been doing that over the last six months. Uh, you've, you are seeing some of the uh, 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 results of my uh, hard work in that area. We just hired a VP for student success. Uh, he's on campus already. He starts tomorrow. Uh, Dr. David Braverman right, uh, to succeed John Smith, who has done a fantastic job, great guy, uh, done a great job. Uh, so today we are interviewing one of uh, 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 one of the finalists for the VP for uh, enrollment and management position. Uh, so one candidate today, another one on, on the second, uh, two great finalists. I mean, on paper alone, I could pick uh, easily. That's how strong the poll was. 
um, actually led by this search was led has been led by um, uh, Dean Clow, who is becoming the interim provost, and uh, uh, we are launching a new search uh, for the uh, uh, VP for Finance and Administration. Uh, we had the interim leadership in Teresa Smith, uh, who lives in um, in a nice place in uh, on the East Coast, who also has done a fantastic job. Uh, she and I thought a lot about, thought very similar on a number of things, uh, important issues. This is her last day. I really wish her well, Teresa, if you are watching. Maybe not. Uh, maybe she's not watching. Um, so we have uh, Shannon Sutton, uh, who is the grand director, uh, who did the job for a couple of months before. So it's not a stranger to that uh, position. Uh, so uh, Billy uh, was interim provost for two years. Uh, um, uh, did a fine job. Uh, now, um, uh, having him do the job again, uh, the transition would be minimal, uh, no disruption. Um, uh, so, uh, and he knows everybody, more people than I do, right? I'm still newish. Um, so the transition uh, right now is pretty smooth. Um, who's, who's a better cook, you or Billy? Because he likes. I wouldn't cook. know. He has to make that judgment. I never eat his cooking, nor have I, uh, <laughs> nor has he eat, uh, eaten mine. Yeah, maybe him. We will find out, right? Someday, I hope. Yeah, I'll eat your food too if you cook for me. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, um, so um, I hope, you know, in the next few, I'm taking it uh, uh, very thoughtfully, very uh, methodically, uh, listening to a lot of sides. When I listen to uh, the faculty, Senate, talk to the UPI, talk to the trustees, talk to students frequently, so I get perspective from all sides, uh, doing things uh, thoughtfully and respectfully. Let's talk about the, the the big one, which you mentioned, but let's get into a little bit more. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons you're you're here, I assume, is enrollment. We need yeah. we need butts in those seats. I mean, we our enrollment has dropped precipitously. I mean, we were at fourteen five back in seventy four. Yeah. <laughs> and we've just you know, a lot, and it has not just been unique to us. It's happening around the country. Yeah. yeah. What are you going to do to to increase enrollment? Yeah. Now this uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, that's uh, obviously a very important question. But I want uh, uh, any audience out there to understand enrollment is very important. But that's only one of many many measures of uh, success, institutional success, right? Um, uh, I name that first because. Over the last many years, uh, we uh, I saw a decline across the nation. Uh, I was I'm thinking about data I saw a few years back. Right, the Northeast has a sharper decline in, in a high, the number of high school uh, leavers. The Midwest was a second. The growth was seen on the West Coast and the uh, South. Right, so uh, now. Uh, the truth is, uh, many, many people are not having as many children as they did before, right? Correct. In the last few years, international recruitment was also a challenge. Because of COVID, um, because of the way international relations are played out between countries, right? So, so COVID, international relations, they have not been helpful, helpful to international recruitment. So right now, I have been spending a lot of time uh, working with our uh, recruitment team. I'm talking about people like Gary Swigan and Doug Freed, and they are really profession good professional. They know the business. As of today, uh, we are uh, they already shrunk um, the deficit between uh, uh, a few days ago and today. We are down to a hundred uh, something. Uh, under 200 of deficit. So that's why it's a priority, right? Now, that priority, while it's important, we want to recruit uh, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. So, so the, whole, the whole gamut, we need to do this area better, we need to do better throughout the state, we need to do better throughout the country and the world. Exactly, and I'm, I'm emphasizing a couple of new things. Though. First of all, new markets, places that we have not been to. We need to uh, aggressively explore those markets. How, how do we how do we do that? For example, with, with COVID and and the restrictions on bringing people. Oh, no, in. good question. Fair question. You no, know. um, uh, we we are doing uh, we have been doing more virtual events, but uh, recently more uh, real events, in person events, right? I saw some students' parents at an event on campus a couple months ago, and we are doing more of that now. 
uh, going out more as well, re re traveling more. Online, we can always do work. Online recruitment or online program, we can always do online recruiting. Internationally, uh, once the, the restrictions are lifted, we will do more e recruitment uh, outside the country. Another important piece I want everybody to understand is really the, uh, is the truth of the old cliche, you know, uh, one bird is worth more, uh, uh, worth um, two in the bush. Okay. What we do with the re student retention, the students we have on campus, WIU is a good institution. institution. Now, somebody will tell you, right, you know, you're as good as, as strong as your weakest link. Right? Well, one of our weak links is student retention. We graduate a lot of highly successful students, but many did not graduate. And so, again, that explains why I'm emphasizing a lot on the importance of retention. We, we should increase the retention rate from the consistently 65% or thereabout, hovering around 65% freshman to the second year. We should try to increase it to 68, 70, 71, 75 percent. My former institution hovers around 71, 72. How? Now, so here, we have a retention initiative office now. We just developed a plan that's being vetted across the campus. I reviewed that plan several times. A lot of very interesting ideas in there. This is led by, uh, 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 by Justin Shu, who's the executive director of um, uh, retention initiatives. All, that's very important. That a plan we need to implement. That a plan come this fall. Uh, now, advising. We have college advisors and university level advisors. I'd like them to f to shift their focus to exclusively on student retention. That has to be done, right? Because uh, you know, advising is a critical joint in the entire process. I uh, can know there are issues that are harder to overcome financial problems. When you don't have money, right. you cannot continue college, right? And then academic issues. If you don't make, make a good grade, you can't continue. Then I would see also add the cultural, uh, uh, cultural uh, barriers. By that I mean, you know, am I a good fit in this university? Do I like Macomb well enough to stay here for four years? I, you know, you and I just talked about racism. There are students telling me, well, we felt followed in the X store, you know, a Y, you know, shop. And, you know, that's not right. I was followed once in Eastern Pennsylvania. I was already a professor, right? Yeah. <laughs> because, because, you know, you're Chinese, you don't look the same. It's possible, I don't know. Uh, so culturally, we want to make the campus, uh, you know, um, welcoming respectful understanding of differences so that people feel protected, respected. Inclusion is very important to you in yeah. terms of yeah. in, in terms of opening us up and, and making sure that we yes. that we aren't racist, that we are yeah. welcoming all yeah. different groups. Yeah. No, exactly. We, uh, that's well put, uh, well said, uh, uh, Grady. Um, we want to treat people as people. Um, you know, uh, people all deserve respect, deserve understanding, deserve an opportunity to be successful, right? A college should do that, a faculty member, a staff member. Now I've been saying loudly in my form, since I was a dean in my former position now here, student retention is everybody's responsibility. I would include you and the mayor and you know everybody in town. Help us keep the students here make them feel, uh, you know, uh, they belong here, they are part of the community. I know the difference, right? Um, you know, young people versus, you know, residents, uh, they all have their own interests that need to be taken care of. Um, but, you know, a helping hand, a, a friendly smile would make a difference in a young student's life. Town Gang, we have uh, you have the you have the good fortune of having a mayor who's who's very open, who's yeah. very yes. who, who, right. who's willing and wants to wants to work with you. Yeah, yeah, very true. And the mayor and I have met a number of times, and and uh, we share. Uh, he, he, I know he would agree. I share my thoughts with him about important issues. He does the same thing. 
you know, uh, we are going to have lunch again in the future to talk about the uh, stuff between the city and the campus. I do believe in Tangang relationships. Um, I, I, my, the way I define the relationship between these two entities is interdependent, mutually supportive. Uh, I do think we have, I have that from this mayor and from this town. Uh, I want the town to fully accept me as the new leader, uh, support what I do. I won't be a perfect president, let's face it. I hope you are more perfect than me, but I know I'm a, not a perfect human being. Certainly I will not be a perfect president. Understanding each other is important, knowing all the, the other entities' mission is important, and finding common grounds, right? Uh, we are here, we live on this earth for 80, 90 years, that's a, right? In oh, the, I hope so. Yeah, it's a <laughs> short time in the long uh, annual of, a, of a human uh, civilization. Uh, if we here solve our three problems, then we would make progress for the town and for the university. Both would benefit for a good relationship, good rapport. So far, you, you have met former uh, uh, trustee chair Epperly. I have. You've met Kirk Dillard, and you've met Connie Kowal, and you've survived all three of those guys who are three of the biggest characters yeah. we'll ever have around yeah, here. Yeah, that's right. But three of the strongest supporters I of did WIU. Them, yes. Yeah, I, I met some of them twice already, so very friendly people. They are very interested in the welfare of the university, the future direction of it, and I appreciate those. And, how, about, uh, how about the, uh, we, we talked about the SWOT analysis, yeah. strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. What do you, how, how how do you evaluate our situation? Or you've touched on you've touched on some of that, but maybe a little yeah. further explanation. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, to preface you know, that, uh, uh, this year uh, uh, the the current fiscal year ends today. Oh, uh, WIU is ending the fiscal year on a positive note. Good. That's very. I've been sharing that news uh, with alumni on the last couple of trips, uh, uh, so that's really important to know. Second, I also want the audience to know. Uh, the university is in a good place because we just received the final word from HLC, the Higher Learning Commission, that we are fully uh, re-accredited for another 10 years. Oh, really? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great yeah. news. I'm, I've been sharing that news, but not on, on a yes. public uh, you know, uh, occasion like this. Those are really important. Uh, we did receive, uh, uh, we are receiving $89 million to build a uh, uh, a, a new center for the performing arts, and Billy Clow has been deeply involved. Uh, any any idea on groundbreaking? No, I I'm not going. To, I, I wish I could say something more definite. My, I heard you know we could break grounds in December, as early as December, maybe January. But let's hope that's true. We'll, we'll keep yeah. a spot warm. That's right. You know exactly. We'll get the shovels in. That's a good. Thing. At the university again, the strengths we we have uh, good programs. Uh, faculty who know their business, good teachers, good uh, scientists or, or scholars. The staff, uh, I think they are understanding of the university's uh, uh, situation in terms of personnel, uh, finance, uh, you know, um, uh, organizational structure. I'm, I'm trying to improve the organizational structure too. And only yesterday I just shared uh, some of the book titles I have been reading. Uh, that guides me in my thinking about uh, organizational efficiency uh, and effectiveness in leadership. You know, I cited uh, Carol Dweck's The Mindset, uh, Patrick Lanciani's uh, The Advantage, um, uh, uh, Lee Bowman and Terence Deal's book on reframing organizations. Uh, finally, a 1980s book uh, given to me by a faculty as a gift, a faculty in Quad Cities. Uh, the transformational leader. Uh, those books have been very useful in the way I think about organizational strength and weaknesses uh, and uh, team, leadership team building uh, and enhancing uh, you know, university stature. Um, and now, right now, the, the weakness mainly is really how do we grow our enrollment and retention? How do we generate more dollars to uh, afford a salary increase for our faculty and staff. I know uh, the question they ask of me. I know uh, that they deserve uh, you know, um, a lot of good things for the good work they put in. Uh, we will be there once we really improve um, our enrollment and our finance. So I want, uh, the, the, many of them know my 
uh, uh, my thoughts on this. Uh, but I wanted them to know I have not stopped thinking about this. The broad leadership is very uh, good about it too. They recognize the challenge we have today and that we want to overcome tomorrow. Therefore, the day after tomorrow we can uh, do more things with more dollars. And, you know, that's, that's one area we want to really improve uh, enrollment related to finance. Um, uh, the, 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 the threat, pro, uh, you know, uh, th threats can be understood from a political viewpoint, a societal viewpoint, and then in this case, even international. Today, you know, if you read uh, Thomas Friedman's book, uh, nobody can be immune. Um, no country can be immune, uh, even though that country can be economically strong from another country who is going through financial, economical, economic challenges. Right, sure. so the, the 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 joke was if if China coughs, America might catch a cold, vice versa. Well, COVID happened, nobody was spared. I mean, nobody, everybody was affected. So we no longer we no longer work in a silo. So the threat can be local, can be regional, can be international. You mentioned you mentioned China, can uh, kind of off the subject, but maybe it's very yeah. germane as well. Yeah. But U.S. Chinese relations can we can, can they come together? I, I certainly hope so. I used to you like you like the fact that I read a lot. You know, there's a there's a famous ballad called the Mulan Ballad, which made in, was made into a cartoon movie in Disney by Disney right years ago, uh -huh. and the, but that was based upon the the book uh, nonfiction called uh, The Woman Warrior, written by a Maxine Hong Kingston, uh, who came close to, a, I guess, uh, to a major international price. Regardless, that book says, uh, as far as the author knows, in the history of man humankind, nobody was able, has been able to reunite unite both North America and Asia yet. Uh, there is another famous ballad, I'm a literature professor, right? Called, uh, by Rudyard Kipling called The Ballad of the East and the West. By the way, I published an article, on, uh, essay on it. I really like that essay I published. I don't like everything I published, but that article I do like. It's a long essay published in Mexico, in English. Uh, so, you know, the, the ballad says, East and the West never shall the twin meet. They are, two, they are twins. They were, geographically, they are not going to meet. Right, if you are familiar with uh, the Wagner theory, right, it used to be one mass of land, they drifted to other parts of the world. Unless you know those parts, you know, drift back together, China and America will not meet. The differences are not geographical; they are societal, they are political, or they are geopolitical. They are racial, right? Different people. Right? The Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, they look more alike than you know, other groups. Right? Um, so I, I do think, though, the two countries can work together. They can look for common grounds. And I, used, I, 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 used, I did a minor in U.S.-China relations, actually, uh, you know, looking, looking at a lot of these people, how they, people like Henry Kissinger talks about U.S.-China relations, how the Chinese premier does the same thing. Uh, or what are the go-betweens doing between these two countries, like the Bushes, right. like Harry Kissinger? They have been the go-between for four or five decades. Yeah. Now, you know, if, if they can get the parties together to talk, uh, a greater hope for humankind between both sides of the Pacific Ocean. So now, certain things they can collaborate better. Other things they may need more time. But if we can solve this problem, would be the, like the Middle East problems, right? The same thing. It's religion, it's races, ethnicity, territory, economic. Economic. Well, economic actually not as important. Looking from a political viewpoint. Yeah. Right, so that's a huge topic. I, I don't want to pretend to be an expert in it. <laughs> How about technology modalities? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of enrollment, are we going to, yeah. uh, what's our student body going to look like in the fall? What, what, uh, what numbers will be here, headcount, and how many of them will do, be doing online, or will we be having a combination of, of yeah, the two? Yeah, that's a very important question. Earlier, uh, when we were review, previewing the questions, um, you mentioned the book I uh, co-edited with my wife, 
yeah. probably two years ago. That's uh, you know uh, leadership in technology innovation. Right. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, technology leadership for innovation in higher education. Right. And you when you you co you co edited. Well, it's one your, of the yeah. articles that touches upon using technology to do many different things. Right, um, technology uh, is a miracle when it's properly used, when it's reliable. Right, uh, you know if you. If we go back to uh, the 18th century when electricity was first discovered, uh, when uh, Mary Shelley wrote the famous book on Frankenstein, right? Yes. The technology can be a monster when it works against you. So it's really a, a double-edged sword. Overall, though, I think one, uh, one edge of the sword is sharper than the other. The proof, the goodness of the technology. Uh, technology is an important tool or instrument uh, for innovation including curricular innovation, recruitment, right? Now, certainly an important tool for uh, online modality teaching. Well, that happened with, during COVID. All our faculty were able to teach online. Pennsylvania, Illinois, all the same thing. That's one of the silver linings that came out of uh, COVID. People are using technology more, Zoom, so there was a there was a there was a, a silver lining with, oh, with COVID. There, yeah. there was. I believe that every things happen. Yeah, every, uh, 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 I do not want to say that bad things happen for a reason, right? We wish they did not happen, but if they happen, we have to somehow learn from it. Try so one one of many things we learn from it is well, technology does wonders, and we can maximize the use of technology. Um, and uh, it, you know, instruct online modality teaching uh, is uh, is achievable. And I, I mentioned Confucius and Socrates earlier. When Socrates and Confucius were teaching, their technology was a uh, was a, a flat surface yeah. of a rock for Confucius, right? Or a, or a bamboo stick, because that you can write on the ground. This is the word I wrote. Right. Today we don't need to do that. Uh, so um, uh, uh, WIU. He just hired a uh, director for online education. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm, I need to find out whether he's already here or not. Uh, in my mind, we are going to expand our online teaching. Will, will we try and get our residence halls filled again? Or? Well, well no, 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 there's, there's no doubt. The online, te the online programs will be, should be and will be geared mainly towards adult learners. There are, oh, there are about yeah. 38 million in this country. 38 million adults who had some college experience but did not finish a college degree. Those people, many of them need to go back to college to yeah. get a degree. We want some of them to be our students. So technology is here to stay. Online education is here to stay. And students are learning in different, in different modes, different modalities. So, uh, and many professors are adapting to that as well. How about intercollegiate athletics? Are we going to stay Division One? At this point, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, you know, I hope we will stay there uh, in as long as possible. Uh, the, the issue is really about um, uh, how do we sustain uh, our operations in athletics, uh, and with what conference can we should we continue? Right? We want to have a lot of wins. Uh, and I'm asking the uh, the athletics department, you know, to you know, to win a few games for WIU, right? Uh, um, we have some really good coaches in there. Um, uh, coming out of COVID, I hope they will find ways, uh, you know, uh, to uh, better train our players. Uh, the governor just signed an NIL, yes. as you know, that will benefit a lot of uh, student athletes. Hopefully, also uh, the university. You know, uh, we had discussions about um, uh, uh, the possibility of switching from one conference to another. And those conversations are still ongoing. And there's no clear outcomes yet. Uh, until then, um, you know, I won't be able to say a whole lot because we are looking at the financial implications for a switch. How about the uh, how about the appearance of the campus? That's that that is you know when when people come here and they 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 drive in and they see some of this nice signage we have now, but you know the berms and so forth. It's very important to have a a, a good looking campus yes. when people come here. It makes that no, first impression. No, I, I totally agree with you. And the, one of the things uh, when I said institutional distinctiveness, uh, I meant campus beautification as a part of it. 
you know, my favorite metaphor, favorite metaphor has always been a restaurant, right? You like food too, right? If you go to a restaurant, is the food good? Number one, I would, for me, right? Number two, is the service good? Number three, does it have a good ambiance? If all three conditions are present, I go there over and over again. I will not hesitate. I've done that in many different cities. People know why how you go there to eat only one thing, but regardless, <laughs> almost always the one thing I eat uh, repeatedly. Uh, anyway, um, so the, the same would be true of university. You know, do you have my program? And in that program, do I have, you know, um, great professors and scientists teaching me? We have that, right? So do I have good support staff that solve my problems? And the leaders, too. And then am I in a beautiful environment? And I've visited a lot of universities throughout the world, you know, in Africa, Europe, Asia. Our campus is good. It does need some work, the road work, yeah, uh, right. trees. I told this to uh, Troy Rhodes, who is a great guy, a great worker. Wonderful job. Yeah, we need, we need to look at things like that. Can we make it even prettier? Right? It makes a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. How about uh, the digital rec center that's uh, happening over on, on Adams Street, the uh, well, I think you, athletics? You probably really meant, uh, I have not been in that space, honestly, okay? I've been to many buildings, but not every one of them. Um, so I think you meant really the eSports center. Yes, yeah. eSports. Yeah, and it started taking off, and I had something like that when I was in Pennsylvania, becoming more popular, students like it. My hope is they will be able to participate in national games so that we can win too. Um, I, I understand. I need to head over sometime, um, you know, uh, to meet the players to see how it's managed. Uh, so I won't be able to give you an intelligent comment on it until I see it. What, uh, what, what three things in your life are you proudest of? Well, I, I, a lot, you know. Uh, oh, that's a, a very interesting question. Uh, I, I, I made some really good decisions I'm very proud of, you know. Uh, I'm proud of my family, uh, you know. Uh, I have good kids, my wife is very supportive, so a good family. I had a good parents, I mentioned already. My fa extended family, my own right. birth family and my current family. I'm very proud of the fact I made a decision to come to this country. I became a citizen, a uh, very important decision. Uh, another important decision I'm proud of is, um, uh, I mean, Decision to come to America and become a citizen. That's one. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 I thought a brilliant decision, to use a British expression, brilliant. A uh, brilliant decision was to, uh, um, to go to grad school at Beijing University. I think that's a really a most important turning point in my life. It's a dream for many in China. Uh, too many, you know, go to Beijing University. How do you do that? Only very, very few get to that. It's more comparative with the Harvard because more people, right? Um, so uh, uh, certainly a, a decision I'm very proud of. Um, uh, I am proud of that I have led several institutions uh, with good results. Um, uh, another thing I'll say less about, this reflects on my, both my Chinese and American identities, you know. I was able to uh, publish most of my books and articles in English, my second language. I did not learn English until I was 16 and a half. From ABC, from the alphabet, 16 and a half I started. In nine months I was in college. So it's, uh, um, then I'm able to write it, speak it, and, uh, and publish in it. And the, some of the books are uh, published by very prominent publish like Columbia University Press, the University of Edinburgh Press in Scotland, oh boy. Beijing University yeah. Press, uh, MLA, uh, the most prominent um, organization on language and literature in this country, Modern Language Association. Let's, let's look two or three years down the road. Yeah. And if someone was going to think of Western Illinois University, what word would you like to have them use to describe our institution? Yeah, I, in the three years uh, is long enough for me to make a difference, if I can make a difference. Uh, you know, so I would like three years later, 
uh, would be happy to hear alumni you tell me, hey, the university in Morel is, is stronger. Uh, enrollment uh, is growing. I, I, can, I, I can't tell you today, you know, what the number will be like, right? Knowing the national trend on enrollment and the retention. Uh, and uh, employees are happier because of your leadership. You know, I won't be ha able to make everybody happy. I know that. I will try. Uh, that's one of the mottos I had from my former institution in Vermont. Uh, Say on, right? Uh, uh, I will try. Um, so, uh, and um, uh, the university uh, is in a better place uh, by all accounts um, because of my leadership, because of my efforts along with my colleagues. You know, um, so um, it, again, it's a little too early to make any predictions. Um, I want to tell you that I'm here trying to lead. I'm here trying to um, uh, build the university up, not down. How about the role of alumni? Uh, very important. Uh, I met a lot of nice people like yourself, and uh, they are all interested in the fair, uh, welfare of the university. Uh, they have interesting opinions, uh, often good suggestions. Um, I have tried to implement a few you know, recently about the signage, for example, listening to Apparly. Uh, you know, uh, oh, yes. yeah, uh, marketing strategies, listening to uh, Connie, right? You know, uh, so people do have good ideas for us is to what extent can we implement those good ideas? Do we have the resources? At the same time, the alumni, if you are listening, you know, we, we need, always need your support. Whether it's five dollars or five million dollars, I'll take both. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the best advice you ever got? I got a lot. I said, and I'm not sure which is the best. You know, a lot of uh, good advice from people, and I mentioned a few. Uh, I mentioned my high school English teacher. Before I went to college, she gave me a textbook, a Japanese textbook. She was saying goodbye to me and uh, pushing a bicycle. I never forgot that moment. She said, I have a gift for you. She, she believed in me and my brother. We both went to Beijing then, right? So she said, um, you know, I want you to get a college degree. You are going to college. And this is uh, uh, July or August of 1979. I was uh, not even 17, right? Uh, so um, she said, but uh, uh, someday I want you to go to grad school. But if you go there, you need a second foreign language. So she gifted me with a Japanese textbook published in Japan. I still have that book somewhere. I did learn Japanese for a year on my own. I still speak, you know, uh, a, a good amount of Japanese. What I could see, and I could see quite a bit of it because of that experience. Uh, so, um, so that I did go to grad school. I, I believe I went to the best grad school in China, right? Beijing University. Great professors, great thinkers. A lot of important leaders coming out of that university. Um, that's one. Uh, Learn from a, a retired president and, uh, how to manage uh, my own emotions and my own uh, image, how you manage anger. Another former, pres uh, former president uh, teaching me uh, how to uh, solve problems, not letting them survive, not letting your problems survive you. I got good advice from my parents all along. You know, I mentioned one to, from my mother to be reflective, to be thoughtful, reflect on what you did today when you are not sleeping. Um, uh, a lot of good stuff. I can't uh, name them all in one breath. Too, uh, sometimes too many. There are a lot of things from books. A lot of books you know, I read. One individual sentence that taught me something. A lot of it. Um, if if tonight. <clears throat> snap your fingers and you could have dinner with somebody, just you and this person, just living or, or deceased, who would that be? Tough question. Um, you know, I, if I could uh, bring back my parents, I would uh, have a dinner with them now. Sure. Right now they are both uh, uh, gone. I could tell them about, you know, my experience really coming to America. You know, introduce my children to them, right? That uh, yeah. um, I wouldn't mind having a dinner with Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, um, I learned a lot from him, uh, reading his writing and his um, uh, his poetry. 
uh, books about him. Now I'm, I'm in Lincoln Land, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, now I would like to have dinner with you too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we can certainly get that. We can certainly get that done. Yeah. What's your uh, What's your view on the importance of a liberal arts education? No, it's uh, you know uh, today uh, and more than ever, I think a liberal arts education is very important. I cited the example of a story, I, a real story I told, right? A woman expressing uh, ignorance uh, about education. Uh, let me quote, um, uh, quote uh, um, uh, William Connie, right? William Connie is a big person about, or was, uh, about uh, liberal arts education. Liberal arts education in his mind is about connecting the dots, right? Uh, we are, people all read. Um, but uh, it requires a special ability to connect issues, topics, problems, or even humans. Right? Once you can make that connection, you will be able to acquire a larger perspective, solve the problem with a greater capability. Now, for me, liberal arts education is, is a foundational education. Indeed, you cannot build a castle on the sand. You cannot build a ca castle in the air, right? No, it has to have a foundation, unless you are a bird or you are a plane, right? So that's how important uh, critical thinking. Um, I would, my own, my own saying, I teach my children about this, holistic thinking. That ties nicely to liberal arts education, connecting the dots. William Cronin, Thomas Friedman would say similar things. I'm seeing something a little different. Critical thinking, creative thinking, then holistic thinking, right? When you need to focus on the issue, critical thinking skills are very important. When you want to know an issue from a larger perspective, holistic thinking, you can copyright this, right? Uh, or trade the market. Holistic thinking is, uh, I think, essential uh, to the way you view problems. But to, to, to have that, a holistic thinking, critical thinking, creative thinking, you need to both, uh, use both sides of your brain. And you need to uh, read a lot. You want to read, in my opinion, in my own experience, um, I used to read a lot of science writings, uh, but whether it's literature, um, or, or I read a lot of business books to be a leader, right? Leadership literature has been mostly written by faculty in business. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, and I'm one of very few Chinese who read the Bible. <laughs> I taught my son to read the entire book. Very few Chinese, I tell oh, you yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you read, you read, you, the more you read, the better you become as a thinker, as a leader, and certainly as a citizen. Now, to accomplish that, that uh, you want to have a broader, hopefully deep, broad and deep foundation a foundation of knowledge. In my mind, Gordy, if you look at a, 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 a board of, che a board of uh, for chess, right, whether it's international chess or Chinese chess, right, um, or if you are looking at the filling in blanks, the human brain has a lot of blanks in it, right? Now, uh, once you read a book, once you pick up a piece of knowledge, one of the many, many blanks gets filled. The more you feel, the better. The only thing that I can accomplish that task is a liberal arts education. A liberal means generous. Liberal means a lot. So do a lot of general education. Right? Whether it's literature, it's sciences, it's social sciences, they give you a way to understand two things in important ways. To understand yourself as a human being and the humanity as a whole of which you are part to understand the self. And then uh, associated to the understanding of the self and humanity is the social world that humans constructed. Our institutions, our buildings, our highways, our spaceships, that's all human, that's all cultural. But then again, to achieve those things, there has to be a strong relationship between an understanding of the social, human world, a social world, social construct, but also the natural world the rivers, the mountains, the outer space. Now, so that again, so to, to achieve those two goals, knowledge, to, to quote Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. How to gain knowledge, you learn. 
So I'm a good sub there. <laughs> what's uh, what, what's the f uh, a lot of the speeches you've given, and you're obviously a very learned individual. What's favorite speech you, you like to give? What, what do you like to talk about when you're out in public? If you have your, your chance. speeches, is there a topic you like to talk about? Uh, higher education, international relations, um, uh, literature. Uh, Food, you know, I talked about, you know, I, I wouldn't mind talking about the food. It's not a, a travels. So, you know. Uh, where, have, where have you not been that you'd like to go? Because <laughs> you've been almost everywhere. Yeah, I've been to a, not, a number of continents. I would like to see South Africa, uh, Northern Europe, um, the Antarctica. <laughs> uh, I was down under in Australia, right? Um, Parts of China, I'm not familiar, and I like Tibet. Um, I would like to go back to my birthplace and see, I left you know, when I was only one, right? Uh -huh. um, but would that be the same way you don't go with your parents, right? Okay. Um, some place in this country I've not been to, right? Uh, uh, Yosemite. <laughs> what? Argentina, yeah. What do you do, what, uh, what do, you do for fun what, when you have a spare moment? Yeah, I, I, I used to do a lot. I used to play you know, a, a ping pong a lot. Uh, table tennis, and uh, I used to swim a lot. And in Macomb, you know, other, you know, unless I go to the swimming pool on campus, uh, I have no pool in the backyard, right? So um, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I would f I go fishing with my son or my daughter. I taught both of them to fish. They're both pretty, they're better than me, actually. Um, so, uh, um, Again, I, I would find time cooking a meal for me or my family whenever I can, yeah. I'm, uh, as we've chatted, I've, yeah. I've told you, I've, I've been here a very long time. Yeah. I came here in 1964 yeah. as a yeah. student, with the exception yeah. of two years in graduate school in Florida. I've been here ever since. Um, what questions would you have of me as someone who's been here for as long as I have? Yeah, no, it's, that's a very, a very important asset, right? You have a lot of institutional memory. You have a, 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 a large body of knowledge of alumni, so I guess, you know, uh, what can I do better to engage the alumni? Doing what you're doing, getting out and, out and seeing them. Just <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll see that, you're right. Yeah, let Amy take you around. That's right, Amy has been doing a fantastic job, you know, she's very thoughtful. She and I did travel to Florida, uh, and then with Brad, we were in Arizona, so uh, it was good. Been, yeah. Well, it's been about an hour and a half. I think we've, uh, oh, really? we've, we've covered quite a little bit yeah, here. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Wong, thank you so very, very much well, for thank spending you. some thank time you for the with opportunity. us today. Yeah. Yeah. And to you folks, uh, thank you for, so very, very much for joining us today as we interviewed uh, the 12th president of Western Illinois University, and, and hopefully it won't be our, our last interview with him. And thank you so very, very much for watching. Take care and have a, have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.